When I first went into it, it was all about money and stuff like that. It's not about the math. I don't believe in life insurance. It's yo-yo, you're on your own. You never recover from that. It's a way of controlling. So I took a different road because God puts these in front of me. The market declined dramatically and he died and I got 100% of the money back. I wasn't the greatest insurance guy in the world. Just waiting a number of years as it goes up. All right, well, welcome to another mastermind session here. Everybody here, Joe, has separated themselves from everybody else here. There's uh, 2,000 people here. They've separated themselves amongst the masses. And uh, with that, they uh, would love to pick your brain about how to advance their entrepreneurial endeavors and serving their clients in the marketplace. So that being said, they're going to ask you a question. Sure. And we're going to ask that you limit it to 60 to 90 seconds. I got a minute, it. minute and a half. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll be here for another three, four hours. <laughs> and you got a car. Got so a car. so uh, who is going first? So first golf score or who's going first? Yeah, so I know we talked a lot about uh, faith and the role that faith plays in the business. And you talked about that love is what casts out fear. Yeah. For you, how do you see that playing into the life of somebody who comes into the industry for the first time? Well, you know, when I when I first went into it, it was all about money and stuff like that. You know, I never who I was and what I did were not connected. So so that was the whole thing. And so I, I honestly believe, well, this is my book. I believe God interceded in this thing. You know, I got in the business because... I was a Catholic big brother, and Tom Costello, who played for the New York Giants as linebacker, was on it, and he said, you should join this thing. That's the only reason I did it. Wow. So I didn't do it because I had this, you know, my, my daddy died, and I was, you know, so I wasn't in any of that stuff. So it happened, so I just felt the hand of God, you know, through this whole thing, and it was a series of discoveries. And that, uh, that first big one was, you know, the idea of uh, Joseph Campbell with the, this guy, this Native American, you know, someone who looked like me back then said this guy was a savage, you know. And so it brought it together in terms of who I was and what I did was separate. Now they came together. So then the total absence of existence, because I was so young when my father died, the impact that was on. And so I saw it from a completely different thing. So I took a different road. So that's, as I said, a lot, some people of financial services think I'm the industry chaplain, you know. But I think that's the core issue. It's taking, it's dealing with the rejection and all that stuff. You gotta understand it. And, and what else would be more challenging, you know, than to be able to, to do that? But the end product is unreal, like the guy I talked about in, in Beirut, you know. Yeah. Said, uh, you know, dying, said, talk to Fred, he'll take care of you. That, that, so that's an added layer. So, and then discovering, because God puts these in front of me. You know, discovering the fact that the way I think in the future we will we will be able to is getting out of the numbers game and then almost becoming like a life coach, which is desperately needed because everyone's walking into retirement. This will be a ball. Six months later, ready to put a gun to that. Actually, and what I said too was true. The the isolation kills, and it's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So people that have no meaning and purpose, even well off, they just float out and, and go. So that's why I love that book that said uh, how to retire and not die. So I think people need meaning and purpose. And look, you guys have one of the biggest challenges you have. You're truly the modern day heroes because you're willing to put up with all of that negativity. Granted, there's some good financial returns, but it's hard sometimes. And I think people all should know that that's the real core issue. I think if more people did that, you wouldn't have the DOL. You wouldn't have everyone think mm -hmm. we're a bunch of humps. Mm -hmm. We all thought we were great, but you know, that that's not the way the public sees us. And that's where I said, you know, nurses. I mean, we have to swing towards that. So I think when I started, it was all about sales and not sales are bad. Then it was all about planning, but that's a left brain analytical thing, you know, and that, mm -hmm. that was a connect. And I think the next one is service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you can become a service person, meaning that I understand which, you better figure it out what you're gonna do in retirement because it ain't gonna be, you know, you're gonna get sick of driving the Zodiac around the lake. I think that's, that, that's there. So that basically brings it into faith and I was not terribly religious and that's where I saw all of the faith-driven stuff, you know. And I, I love that, you know, where he said, uh, you know, the only way to get rid of fear is, is, is through love. Yeah. And, and I said, wow. I have a question. Uh, you've been to about four or five events now with PHP Agency and you yeah. see we're a young, diverse group. That's great. Uh, not, the, not the typical insurance agent. No. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I tell people, I've got people worked up, but not like this. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so and one of the biggest challenges we face is, 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 is really educating an underserved community of uh, right. minorities and younger individuals. Yeah. What have you seen in your, your career that can give us advice on how do we attack that, that challenge? I think we got to incorporate more stories into our presentations and where they are, you know, and I mean, that takes time to be able to do that, so you should expose yourself to as many stories. You know, I got the stuff on my website you could take a look at. I think that has to happen, and, and uh, you know, you also your personal knowledge of neighborhoods. But I, I understand it's like 
this whole voodoo type, you know, no one, no one does that. The crucifix and the garlic <laughs> comes out right, when you mention some stuff. And I think it's all a question. So that's the point. And I, I love the saying, you know, well, I don't believe in life insurance. It's not a religion, okay? Mm -hmm. It's just a financial hedge because you don't know who, and that could be you. And what would your family do? You've got to kind of paint the picture. What would your family do? And you could use my story. I mean, think of it. Do you imagine what my mother thought her life would be back in 1949? You know what I mean? This whole thing. And then she got, you know, she finally got a job as a secretary in the bartender's law. She was a high school graduate. She never had any stuff like that. So you can imagine right after that, the wardrobe she had and the others are going, who does this one think she is? You know what I mean? So you get that shit, pardon me. And then you get the thousand cuts, you know, in terms of, and then the family too. There was something wrong with some, something wrong for a woman to be a widow back in 1952. What it was, who knows? And, and no one helps. No one helps. You know, no one does it. You're, it's as Nick Murray says, it's yo-yo, you're on your own. And, and what I see coming is everyone's on their own. That's why you have to start talking to younger people about the stuff. So you could really load up a life insurance policy if you're 35 years of age. Don't get the most amount of coverage for the least amount of money. Get the most amount, you know, mm -hmm. that goes in because it does so many other things. It's the, it's the way when you retire and you will, who knows what's going to go on with Social Security or what have you. And you're walking into a world where the working age population is shrinking. That's the biggest issue the planet faces, not any of this global warming stuff. It's a way of controlling, my, my, my opinion. Not that, not that it isn't happening, you know. But, but the fact of the matter is that's the big issue. And so I, I can't think of a better profession to be a more ignoble profession to be helping people to solve that. Because as I said, it's, you're on your own and you better take care of yourself because it ain't gonna be the way it was before. And longevity is the biggest issue, living too long. Yeah. Well, Mr. Joe, I, I, got, I have a question. So I obviously deal with a lot of Latino market. And yes. That's a minority is really hard. So we have a lot of macho Mexican people that usually <laughs> we get into the house, into the KTP, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the woman is willing to listen to us, right. but the man just disappears. What will be your line or your way of bringing back that man, that macho man that doesn't want to listen? Like, I don't want to that. I, I don't want to be there, like, whatever the case may be. Well, that's tough. It's cultural, you know what I mean? You got to kind of paint the picture because it does happen, you know? Um, my book's in Spanish, too. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> and, uh, uh -huh, okay. And Portuguese, too. But, but um, <laughs> that is a tough thing, and sometimes you're not going to make the deal on the first appointment. And uh, that's, why, that's why it's the idea of prospecting and everything else. And people are not going to surrender their hardcore. That's why stories help to do that, you know. And, uh, and I just don't think we do enough of it. And I know it's hard to incorporate a story, you know, out of the blue, but we have to work on that. But I think some of the, co look, the bottom line at the end of the day, that's why I got to say next, because you can only work so hard, right? You can only help people who want to be helped. You can only help people who want to be helped by you. And you can only help people who want to be helped by you now. And so that's why you have to have a good tickler system to get back to them, because sometimes things change. There you go, but it's a, it's, a, it's a major challenge. A lot of it comes from the press because they're all math oriented and they say this is ridiculous because you know you paid this fee and you had that. Yeah, but you know, in 2008 everybody bailed out, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's worth it. In other words, who are they to judge? I have a great quote from Susie Orman. You all know who she is, do you? You know, yeah. So she said, you know, uh, she was on CNN and she goes, oh, well, God, you know, a, a death benefit, my God, you know, you have to pay the death benefit, you know, and all this stuff. She was dumping all over it. And a woman called up and she says, you know, this was 2002. This was after the dot-com crash. Was she talking about the VAs? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So she, she, yeah. So the VA, she says, my, my husband put all of our retirement money in the VA. She's like, oh, my God, you know, no one like that. And she said, well, you know, the market declined dramatically and he died and I got 100% of the money back. So what's wrong with that? So she goes, well, in that case, it makes sense. So, so the <laughs> fact of the matter is, I know this, everyone dies. It's just a question of when, okay? The stock market goes up and down, you know? And so how do you, a lot of the newer products that came out help to mitigate some of the risks that are there. You gotta make it clear. That's why I talked about the inflation stuff. And so you gotta pick up on that. A store of value, which is what money's supposed to be, is not the amount, it's the purchasing power of it. And it just, as in a 30 year period, you saw it more than doubles. At 3% inflation, how about try 12 or 14? And you're on your own because this shrinking working age population globally, the only place that's growing is Africa. It's the only place where the population's growing. And that's where a lot of these idiots are running around saying there's too many people, there's not enough. I, I can't give you a definitive answer, but it's just a question of getting on to next and then come back because it's the only thing you're going to do. There's, you, you can get, you know, answers to objections, but they only go so far. When you have somebody hardcore, it's time to get to the next place. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the, 
the, thank you for the value that you're providing first and foremost. So you're impacting a lot of my guys. One of them is actually trying to ask a question about one of the things you're doing, which is the Gratitude Fridays. Yeah. And so they were asking as well, what other things are you doing that instilled, I guess you would say, habits to make the success you have so far? Well, Gratitude Fridays helped a lot, you know. And so what you do is take it seriously. You know, don't wait till Friday morning. Oh, am I going to call? No. You know? <laughs> so so you, you really should do it like six weeks in advance. I look forward to it because it's usually good. Some people just take it in stride. Others can't talk. Literally can't talk. It's the nicest thing that happened to me in the past five years or what have you. And it's important, too, because as you get older, you know, a lot of you guys are young. You know, there's a lot of people that aren't on this planet anymore, And they all get around to it. Well, it doesn't. So it makes me feel good. And then it makes me feel good, and then it engenders me to, you know, get back on the call and get my ass kicked. Because I do what you do. I dial and smile, you know. And then, you know, when you're hot, you're hot. When you're not, you're not. You know? <laughs> and you know, we heard him six years ago. It was like it didn't change, you know. I, I know what that's there. And then I, I do think it's important to re Well, I saw a quote. It might have been from Patrick. It's the idea is, you know, spending an hour a day reading. Is that him? I think it was. It popped up and said an hour, you know, mm -hmm. hour a day is like sure. one-fifth of your day, but, yeah. you know, can do the thing. So I, I get up every morning at 520, and I try it. I, I do like 40 minutes, you know, and, and I read something. And, you know, some of it's better than not, but, but I think that's – I think the other sense, too, is with this uh, – sometimes you don't feel you're being productive, right? You know, you get turned around and then you can't, what's that guy's name? Well, especially at my age, you know, who's his name? Who's the guy? You know. And then I'm not tech savvy, so I, uh, blah, 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 you know. And then you find out that two hours went by and you didn't get a goddamn thing done, you know. Yeah. So that's why I like the idea of having X number of people I have to call. And I have to write it down in a book. I just can't memorize it. So that's the thing that's been helping me because I just feel a lot better after I did it. You know, even if I got 10 no's, I just feel better that, you know, I took it on, and if I keep doing that, it's there. So that, uh, that's, that's the major core of the business, your ability to co constantly be prospect, both in your business, both in terms of recruiting new people and then selling. And, and if you do that, you're, you're good. And if you stop, you're dead, no matter what you know. So I'll ask you this. Why, why do you think there's such a big gap between the understandings of the different uh, uses of life insurance, such as becoming your own bank from like the wealthy, the middle class, and the poor. Why do you think there's such a big gap between the understanding behind? Well, because it always came, you know, it wasn't always this way. You know, in the 1950s, there was Father Knows Best. It was one of those, mm -hmm. you know, sitcom type things. And the guy was an insurance guy and it was worthwhile. So I lived through that in 74 as an in insurance. So what happened was that's when the, that's when the first oil crisis hit. Mm -hmm. So inflation ripped through the roof. So I'm selling $25,000 whole life policies and people seeing that thing erode. So then I wanted to get on Wall Street. So then I wound up getting the job at Payne Weber, you know. And that was a fluke. I didn't think I'd get the job, you know. And so one thing I'd say is it's good to be rare, you know. I wasn't the greatest insurance guy in the world, but at Payne Weber I was, you know. And that was a, a different environment. But I have to tell you, and I would be, well, it's on tape, but who cares. The, <laughs> the, the culture sucked. I mean, it really did. And it's a, I said, man, something happened. This company went under. And it was a joke. This is Wall Street. You know what we do? We blow people out. And after we blow them out, we ask them for more money. <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> you know, wow. that was, that was, that's, that's yeah. what it was then, you know. Because you know what it was when I started? It was insurance, stocks, banks. And then they started coming together. And the reason they came together had nothing to do with client need. See, that's the mm -hmm. problem we had. Mm -hmm. It had to deal with diversifying revenue streams. Mm -hmm. And then all the different cultures, you know, in terms of that. So if you think, Talk to a stockbroker at Payne Weber in 1983. Why am I going to do insurance? You know, does it go on my blotter? Do I get paid the next? I'm applying. What am I applying for? You know, that's the pee in a bottle. What? You know what? You know. So that was the cultural thing. So that's the, the business always operated from a profit motive, and I just think it has to change. Okay. Joe, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talk about um, talking like to the younger generation. I feel like we're living in a world where it's they need that instant gratification. Yeah. I want it. Let's get it now. Like, what are some of the things that you would say we can instill in our kids um, or that younger generation think long term? Well, I think, you know, obviously they have to start savings and then they'll give you the old argument. Well, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, the return is bad. It's not an investment, okay? It's something that you need. And then the other thing is buy term and invest the difference, which is fine. The best insurance you have is the insurance enforced when you die. So there's a great likelihood it ain't going to be enforced when you die if you have term insurance. But that insurance, you know, makes sense. But it's, look, they, they got to be sad about wiser girls, and they're not. 
And the problem is, is they're distracted dramatically. That was the thing I said about social media. You'll never be alone. Well, how the hell can you sit down and think you're addicted to this thing that really dictates your life? You know, and then it's the whole idea of FOMO, fear of missing out, you know. Do you know that the UK has the Ministry of Loneliness? That's for real. This, wow. isn't, this isn't John Cleese. Uh, do you guys know Monty Python? Yeah. 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 The, the, the Ministry of Silly Walks, you know what I mean? It's really bad, and somehow we have to take that that yoke off. I think what really has to be explained is you guys got to be able to take care of yourself because it ain't it ain't the way it was. Mm -hmm. And you know, you got this shrinking. And so I, I don't know if that helps so much in the sales, but you have to break down. They have to understand they got a real issue and it's up to them to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And a life insurance product can help with that. The other thing too for younger people is the insurability option, right? Mm -hmm. It's the fact that you're guaranteeing your insurability. You can get diabetes and then all of a sudden you're through the roof with the thing. Why not do it now? So I'm not a, I'm a big advocate for term insurance too, you know, but buy two million, you know, don't get one million, but you know, we sell it in units, half million units, you know, we want three or four units, you know, and then because take a look at inflation and where it is. So I think, I think that's a, that's a way to do it. So this might piggyback off what you were talking about. You mentioned the longevity of women. Yeah. How, it, more, more talking about um, products and services, insurance. Right. And, living benefits, how important it is, is it for women to be in this industry as an agent? It's a big deal. I mean, I've always been a big advocate for it. Well, it's because of my mother's thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was more sensitive than most guys were. I remember being at MetLife and a guy says, yeah, let's bring the girls in. Well, it's a 48-year-old woman who's, one of them was a, was, a, was, a, was a single parent. That's not a girl, you know <laughs> what I mean? That's not a girl. You know, and so I also think the future belongs to people creating relationships and women do that instinctively. It solves a business problem. It's none of this stuff about, oh, it's, it's equity or what have you. It's, it solves a business issue. And I think women are better at, at being able to create relationships. Every financial services organization is trying to look like what you look like now. They're not diverse. They don't have a lot of women, and, and uh, I think that has to change because women know that. But you got to get that point across in terms of what else can you be doing other than for the sisterhood, right? Think about that. 80% of men die married and 80% of women die single. Mm -hmm. So they're on their own, so they need the proceeds, and then they live longer. Yeah. You saw that, five women for every one guy that's so age 100, that. and the, that's a big deal. So sometimes a little fact like that can come out. You gotta get them thinking that way. Because it's not in the general, you know, it's not in the, it's not in the, the, the general public. Quick question, uh, by, um, transition to older people. Um, being that um, they've seen a lot of more ups and downs in the market, why would you say there's still more people that are actually interested in the high rate of return versus um, like, a, like a fixed annuity or in rate? Well, I think the index really solves kind of a, two problems. I mean, as I said, everyone has a long-term perspective until they get hit with a short-term loss. You know? and then everybody heads, for the, everybody heads for the hills, you know what I mean? There's no atheist in a foxhole, right? So, yeah. so, so it's the same type of thing. So I think you really have to bring that across. But the other part of that equation is also you probably need some equity exposure. Mm -hmm. And I think these index annuities help that, right? In other words, if you looked at it, what I showed you, the stamp to the S&P, that it went up nine times over a 30-year period. But what about all the shit in between, you know? That's what everybody forgets. So maybe I just need a piece. If, if, the, if, if the inflation was two and a half, most people would be happy if they could just maintain their lifestyle. What happens to people is all of a sudden, you know, then, they, then they're, they're cutting the pills in half and all of that stuff <laughs> like that. It's the lifestyle erosion and it's insidious. My experience has been that, you know, most people, you know, get. The older people live through a lot of this stuff. You got a lot of people since, look, 07, 09 was the last big one, you know? Mm -hmm. And then they never saw it before and everything always just goes up. But you, I think to some extent this business is kind of a, a Dutch uncle, uncle. And I think one of the primary premises is you're on your own and you have to take care of yourself and your family because the government ain't gonna do it, no matter what Joe Biden says or any of the other stuff that's out there. So Joe, we'll, we'll wrap stuff up. One last final question. So. Now, I've been in the insurance business now for 24 years. I've been through the 01.com bubble and then the 0709 oh, yeah. recession. Yeah. But both times I've seen the insurance, products and services massively benefit our clients because they inflate, they rise with rising interest rates. Right. At the same time, the attraction of our industry is more so during those periods. Can you talk to that, what you've experienced in, in the 80s when there was a higher interest rate like what we're experiencing right now? What happened to the insurance industry and what happened to the products that the insurance agents were selling? Well... 
you know, the insurance industry had to wake up. It used to be a sleepy old thing back in the 1970s. You know, a lot of mutual companies and they, you know, they kind of hung out. You mm -hmm. know, the guy who was the president of New England Life used to watch the, the uh, Boston uh, Red Sox play, you know, the, you know, the office. You know. So, I, I don't know, some guy goes nowhere. The, the fact of the matter is it had to really wake up. Then the investment people got in. And then it, what happened, if you don't mind the little digression, okay, what happened to me was, you know, 74, the oil crisis hit, inflation went through the roof, and the stuff I was selling wasn't really all that relevant. Then there were all these insurance companies that came in, Executive Life, Xerox Life, Security First, uh, all of these companies. What happened was they had, Prudential and Met had all of these bond portfolios that went completely underwater. Interest rates went to 18%, so you know the bond value of the bonds went down. So all of these guys got into the, they could, they could have high rates because they had hardly any portfolio exposure or whatever. Actually, that was one of the major engines for Drexel Burnham, do you know that name? The, there was a big junk bond thing going on. Uh, for a while, people thought junk bonds were not junk, they were just bonds that had, high quality rates. bonds that just had higher interest rates, you know. <laughs> okay, so they were they they were the big funders for uh, for uh, Drexel Burnham that innovated the whole thing in terms of with the junk bonds until that all exploded. So there were investment people who didn't understand liabilities, and then they were insured. So we kind of learned from each other, you know, what happened. Now I think we're in better shape. I mean, and and the nobody nobody was buying immediate annuities because you're dead, you know, 65, as I said, you know, you took a boat to Ireland and you, you're gone. So many years, and so what happens is that, that conflicts sometimes with uh, investment people saying, well, your performance would have been, yeah, if you would have stayed, for Christ's sake. And what happens, that's where I was talking about the buffer assets. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is that sometimes it goes down and you blow your money, you know what I mean? In other words, if it's down and you're taking money out and it's down 57%, you're out of, out of money. So at least with annuities, it, the whole idea of the measurement of wealth is how much money you have is a recent phenomenon. Did you guys, do you guys know um, Pride and Prejudice? Jane Austen. Jane Austen, yeah. She wrote about the early 1800s in England. And she's talking about Mr. Darcy. Mm -hmm. She never said Darcy had a million pounds. She said he got 10,000 a year. The historical perspective has always been on the amount of the reliability of the income, mm -hmm. ROI, mm -hmm. not the amount of assets you have because they can go poof. So do I have income and is it reliable? Did it keep up with inflation? No, but it's better than the alternative, you know what I mean? So it's kind of tough for investment. And the other thing I talked about, so the mechanism, the mechanism is, is mortality credits. Remember I talked about Social Security? Why does it pay older people more? Why, why just waiting a number of years as it goes up? Because they know, the actuaries know how many people are gonna die, okay? So they're not paying everybody $1,000 a month. They can afford $1,200 a month because they know people are going to die and they're going to be out of the pool. So uh, the people who live pay, pay for the people who die in life insurance. The people who die pay for the people who live. And you don't know how long you're going to live. That's the big question. So that's where, and let me tell you something. People, and as the research points out, I mean, it's just so evident, and yet the investment folks don't get it because they tend to operate in a hypothetical area is the idea that you're going to live longer and the first thing you have to do is make certain that, you're, uh, that you have income needs met. And so that's, you're going through a transformation of it. The baby boomers were all looking at investments and all that other stuff and now they're getting hit with this, you know, turning it to income. Mm -hmm. So that's, you're at the cutting edge to be honest with you. And, and I do really like the, uh, the, uh, the index style. You know, as I said, you know, you don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you, you know. But <laughs> the, the, the whole idea is I just like to stay with my purchasing power, with, you know, to, con to continue that. But there's a lot of misnomers out there, and then the, the financial press sucks. You know, they're, they're always painting the, the picture bad, you know, and, uh, uh, and it's always the thing, you know, today the market's good, uh, you know. So there's a lot of education that has to happen, but the, uh, I think at the end of the day, your ability to have the trust of people, just they'll trust you. And that's, that, that, that comes over time. Folks, make some noise from George. Yeah. George. Yeah. All right.